The theme of today's conference is Life Behind Bars, Compassion and Reform. Personally, I was inspired and motivated to help plan this one-day conference by several factors. The Free Thought Society has a vested interest in the subject, which I will expand upon during my presentation about our donations to prison libraries. Now, years ago, I became passionate about reforming the justice system by watching the television show, Adam Ruins Everything. Adam Conover has produced six shows that deal with myths and misunderstandings of police work, the judicial system, and the incarceration system. Once enlightened, I found that I could not ignore these issues that impact tens of thousands of incorporated human beings every day. As secularists, we have an opportunity to use a distinctive voice to make a difference. And this is why we're here today. Now back to Adam Conover and his show, Adam Ruins Everything. I met Adam through the skeptic community and discovered that he is not only a highly talented person, he is kind, generous, and super friendly. Today, I'm very proud to present a message from Adam as we begin this one-day conference about compassionate prison reform. From me, Adam Conover, to everybody at the Life Behind Bars conference, I'm so happy that you're all talking about criminal justice reform with a skeptical eye. It's one of the most important issues facing our country and is one of the issues that there is the most bullshit about in the media, in the courts, and yes, in our own hearts and minds. So thank you for taking a critical eye towards it. It's one of the most important things that you can do. Thank you so much. Following Adam's message, we are pleased to welcome Nadia Dutchen, who is representing the American Humanist Association as a co-sponsor of this event. Oh, she is also our first speaker of the conference. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, good morning, all. My name is Nadia Dutchen. Um, I am the executive director of the American Humanist Association. And I just wanna say that that was a really great message from Adam Conover. Um, we've got to take a really good look at, and a really good skeptical look at the way that the carceral system treats incarcerated people and affects our communities via the school to prison pipeline. The American Humanist Association is proud to be a co-sponsor of this really important educational event. Our organization is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we've been around for about 81 years. Um, we have more than 240 local groups and more than 37,000 members that work together to bring about a more progressive society where altruism, which is doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, is prioritized instead of just doing good because of the promise of a heavenly reward or the fear of eternal punishment. We do this at the AHA by protecting the separation of church and state, uh, in the courts, and we lobby for progressive policies at the federal level. And we do also do this by building local communities where all people, particularly atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, skeptics, uh, and skeptics can find friendship, understanding, family, and mutual respect. For those of you who are not aware of what humanism is and why we need a, an association for it, uh, it is a non-theistic worldview with ethical values informed by scientific knowledge and driven by a desire to meet the needs of people in the here and now. At the foundation of those values is an affirmation of the dignity of every human being and the preservation of the earth, which is why we're here today. I wanna reiterate, when we say every human being, we mean every single human being, meaning all of those who are free in the world and those who are incarcerated. I wanna to touch on why this is important to me. Um, and this is important to the AJ and the humanist movement also, but personally, speaking personally. Um, when I was in college at Florida A&M University, um, one of the very first things that we examined in our American history class uh, taught by the renowned historian, Dr. James Eton, was the 13th Amendment. And for all, all of you who are not aware what it says, it states, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, this isn't the amendment that, that abolished slavery, but I want to roll back. And one of the things that Dr. Eton asked us to do was continue to drill down into the piece that says, except as a punishment for crime. 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. So let's take a look at that in the current moments analysis. Um, that means that people who are incarcerated are essentially enslaved. And that's the reality. Um, in 2008, there was a book written by Douglas A. Blackman called Slavery by Another Name that examined all of the ways that the very existence of Black Americans post-Reconstruction uh, were criminalized uh, through post-Reconstruction through Jim Crow to create a, a prison-based economy to replace the unpaid labor provided by enslaved <coughs> America was founded with the idea in mind that there would always be a permanent class of enslaved people, and this continues on today. So I don't want us to, like, I don't want us to uh, think about the current carceral system as like a, an actual um, institution that needs to be revered. It should not be. Um, I want us to see it for what it is. As humanists, why this matters to us as humanists, the idea that we would continue to uphold the vestiges of slavery, of any form of slavery, via our carceral system is aberrant and odious. Uh, we as humanists value the inherent worth of, and dignity of every human being and the ability for everyone to learn and grow each and every day. No person should be constantly reminded of the worst day of their lives or the worst action that they've ever uh, inflicted on someone else. Um, we should all have the opportunity for redemption in our own ways. Uh, we also need to, when we talk about, about the carceral system, we're not simply just talking about the prisons and jails. We need to talk about the entry point of over-policing and terrorizing communities of color and the working poor. And if you're not aware, the model for the current form of policing comes directly from the slave and night patrols that forced human beings back into enslavement. So again, not just imprisonment, but also the way that our communities are policed and over-policed. These are both vestiges of slavery. Let's be, let's be again, very cognizant about that fact. Um, there are a lot of people who would say, oh, Nadia, you're just a, a bleeding heart liberal. But we need to recognize that in the world, we are, the, we are the, the country that has the most incarcerated people in the entire world. There are nearly 2 million people, 2 million human beings incarcerated in the United States. Um, and I'm very well aware that there are people who commit extremely violent crimes who should face an appropriate punishment. In this country that uh, averages around 780,000 people out of those 2 million people. And so we need to make sure that there is an appropriate punishment for those folks. But the vast majority of people who are imprisoned are nonviolent offenders and there are better ways to address their needs and the needs of their families. We need to address root causes of many crimes, which are very pointedly poverty, mental illness and addiction. What we fail to acknowledge is that each of these incarcerated people have families and communities who need and love them. Families are also being punished along with the incarcerated people. We're talking about labor, we're talking about love, support and affirmation coming through intact families that are non-existent when people are incarcerated. The conditions in prisons are absolutely deplorable with barely passable and ed edible food, barely clean water and lack of access to proper medical care and little to no access to education, proper job training and mental health or addiction counseling. One of the really interesting and terrible, honestly, um, example of how horrible our system is. In 2018, Hurricane Florence slammed into the Eastern seaboard. Incarcerated people in South Carolina were not evacuated. It should not be lost on anyone here that the animals in shelters, dogs and cats, and other little cute things were evacuated and prioritized over the people who were incarcerated, who were not evacuated. I will repeat again, we must absolutely do better. At the heart of humanism is humanity, empathy, compassion, reason, respect, dignity, and care. This is a humanist issue on every level and providing care and community, actual loving, real community to incarcerated people and their families must not be an afterthought, nor can it be and must it be an act of white saviorism. And I'm saying that very pointedly because it's, it's the truth. We need to take a, a very human and equal and egalitarian approach to how we work with families and incarcerated people and help them get their agency back as, as families and as individuals. 
We will hear from people today who will talk about the more humane ways to treat addiction and mental health challenges and how these conditions can be treated separately as healthcare issues and how providing a community to which they can belong helps to promote good mental and physical health. We will also hear from people who talk about smart recovery as a powerful tool, tool that severely curbs recidivism for those with addiction and behavior control issues and how it can help their families stop codependent behavior, which is critical to the entire family unit healing. More importantly, we need to examine the ways that we can prevent people from going to prisons or jails in the very first place by changing the ways that our communities are over-policed and terrorized and lean into transformative and restorative justice processes that prioritize healing both parties, all of the parties who are injured by crime, both the offended and the offender to ensure that they are reparative healing measures that truly help everyone involved in a crime. In closing, I'm going to give you a quote from John Fire Lamedeer, and I want to make sure that everyone understands that when I speak, I generally speak from a Black and an Indigenous people of color perspective. And so John Fire Lamedeer was an Indigenous activist and, uh, and writer. Before he says, and please know that this is laced with sarcasm, he says, before our white brothers came to civilize us, we had no jails. Therefore, we had no criminals. You can't have criminals without a jail. We had no locks or keys, and so we had no thieves. If a man was so poor that he had no horse, teepee, or blanket, someone gave him these things. We were too uncivilized to set much value on personal belongings. We wanted to have things only in order to give them away. We had no money, and therefore a man's worth could not be measured by it. We had no written law, no attorneys, or politicians, and therefore we could not cheat. We were really in a bad way before the white men came, and I don't know how we managed to get along without these basic things, which we are told are absolutely necessary to make a civilized society. What he was saying is that we've got to examine how we work through transformative and restorative justice in our communities. We don't necessarily always have to do things the way that they have been done in, in the recent past. We can do better as a society, and humanists have the moral impetus to help treat incarcerated people and their families with the care and respect they deserve, and to work with communities to help prevent the conditions that fuel the reason that people commit crimes in the first place. Please listen carefully to all of our speakers today, and most importantly, please plan to take action after today's conference. Humanism is a lived experience and a lived principle, and while we are here to learn, we must take action and help where we can. Thank you again for joining us. And if we have time, I would be happy to take questions. And we do have time. Well, I have a question for you, Nadia. Sure, Margaret. Um, I love the Humanist Magazine. It's one of my favorite publications. And um, I noticed that you've been highlighting uh, prisoner stories. Uh, and I really appreciate that. We need to uh, understand uh, what it's like to be a prisoner. And so not only am I complimenting you on that, but do you have other stories that are being uh, planned in the future for the Humanist Magazine? I believe that we're gonna be opening up some additional um, columns uh, highlighting stories from, from incarcerated folks. And also not just, just stories, but some of their artwork. Um, you know, honestly, some of the things that we get from folks who are incarcerated are some of the most beautiful works um, of art, of poetry, of, of, you know, of just thoughts and essays. Um, we get them quite often. And so we, we do expect to have uh, some, some more of those contributions from our incarcerated siblings um, in the Humanist Magazine. Thank you. I write to a prisoner in North Carolina through the American Humanist Association. That's how I found him. And um, recently, I've been helping him with a number of different things, trying to find a university where he can get a PhD because he's actually gotten two um, a bachelor's and a master while, master's while in prison. Couldn't find a PhD that wouldn't work. They had to work, they wouldn't do correspondence. They had to be live on TV and he can't get on live TV. But um, is it legal for me? And I've, I just wrote to the tar Department of Justice yesterday to find out if this is true. Is it true for me? He wants to use me as an outside address because he has, he knew investing before he was incarcerated and he has some investments. He, um, the mailroom has refused to forward anything to do with that because they say he can't do business while he's in prison. So um, he's using me as an outside address and I am mail, well, I haven't done it yet. 
I was waiting for an answer to find out if this is legal for me to, to be an outside address and to mail him this information. Do you know, does anybody know? I have no idea, Joyce. That is an excellent question and one we should be jotting down to, to answer. I can ask our legal team and I'm certain one of our attorneys can let you know. I will, okay. I'll ask Monica. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering what kind of programs you have for um, preventing um, youth to going into the system. Um, currently, we don't necessarily, as an organization, have programs for that. Um, I think those are probably better levied at the the local uh, on the local level. Um, you should probably check with your local. Um, there probably, unfortunately, is a juvenile detention center in your in your local community. You may want to ask them what their diversion programs look like. I, I don't. I that it's again, it's something that we don't necessarily do at this moment, but it's something that we can certainly look into. Uh, into spinning up at some point in time and partnering, finding out who does that work so that we can partner with them. Thank you for that question. That was an excellent talk. That was fascinating about the 13th Amendment, the argument you made about we're committed to slavery. I've never, I guess I don't know 13th Amendment well, and I, I really want to relook at it. But um, it just seems that we're very committed to punishment and I'm curious what what we actually can do, and I know you have some excellent speakers coming up. I'm looking forward to it. Like what's been being done? I mean, I was in prison many, many years ago, 50 years ago. And um, so I'm just curious what's been happening since I haven't been in prison for 50 years. But I guess we'll find that out. Will your talk be available? Hi, Neil. Yes, um, you're actually lucky. I almost never write them down but I actually did write this one. <laughs> I did write this one down. So it is in print. I will make sure that it's available to you, Neil, uh, and others, if anyone is interested, I'll just put it in a Google document and make it available to anyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm thankful for being here. I am a mother that lost a son and a mother that did incarceration time. And our organization is a mother's voice due to my pain. So I wanted to tell her that was amazing and I appreciate everybody. I know it's gonna be a beautiful day in the circle, but I also wanted to uh, know if she could uh, give me her information and share it because I do go in the Central Juvenile Youth Detention Center and a lot of what she spoke was real. I'm firsthand and I was in there last night and a lot of kids have crimes and we know that each person has their time but they do need the resources and they do need the voices. That's my, why my shirt says a mother's voice is not because it's cute, it's because of the pain I went through. So I truly, truly am um, thankful and just wanted to know if she could share that in, in my email. Thank you guys for the invite. Thank you so much for that, Yvonne. And I did give you my email address. Um, it's, that's my personal, my, like my direct email address. So feel free to email me. I will, um, I got yours and I will email you and you can have my contact information, my phone number and stuff also. I would be more than happy to talk with you. And I'm so, so sorry for the pain that you've endured and know that, you know, we recognize that it's not, it, it is your pain, but it's also pain for the entire community. Um, it, it has a ripple effect on everyone. Um, and so like I, I reach my hands to you and, and give you give you a mom a hug from a mom to a mom. I I, I understand. Thank you, you guys. I'm loving what's going on here because we really really need it, you guys. They really need our voices. They may have committed the crimes, but they're still human. So we have to help these kids because when we're getting older, they're our future generation. And what will we have? A bunch of incarcerated kids with no mental health, no support. That's why I'm here today. Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, myself, I'm a violence prevention specialist and I have worked in the prisons and, and taught batters intervention and anger management, conflict resolution. And I realized that people are not ex are understanding that even the men and women that have grown have suffered childhood trauma, traumatic experiences that led them to, to their crime. So um, if, if there's any way we can expose that, but also in your magazine, hopefully you can highlight those who came out of, of incarceration who are doing wonderfully to inspire those who are behind the wall. Because there's so many men and women who are doing so great at reentry 
who are changing policies in Sacramento. And that's part of what I do as well. I'm a delegate for timedone.org. But we see these, these people who had life sentences who are changing policies for those in the future who come out. So it's a wonderful thing. But if you can highlight some, highlight those success stories in your magazine, just to inspire those behind the wall would be awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Gloria. And yes, we'll, you will hear from people that will talk about, particularly about smart recovery. Um, it's it's the, the, the theory behind it is rooted in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is useful for more than just addiction. It is actually used for at, through regular mental health counseling for average everyday people to help us identify our triggers and, and the way that we're responding in a moment, which is sometimes what happens when we just sometimes lose control. Um, and we're human. We're, we all have failings. I think we can all attest to a time where we have absolutely lost our cool. Um, and it, maybe it did not necessarily result in us committing a crime against a person, but we can understand and we can see how that's possible. And so highlighting some of those success stories, particularly from those that are coming behind smart recovery, um, because it is severely curb curbing recidivism because people are able to really catch themselves before going on to the next step of, of losing control. Um, so I, I agree. I think we will, we will, you know, seek out more and more of those stories and share them out. Thank you so much for all you do, Gloria, by the way, um, and, and for supporting incarcerated folks in, in California. Thank you, Nadia. It looks like we have another question from Live Oak. Yes, good morning. I have a loved one that's been incarcerated and was falsely accused um, four years ago, but he's still incarcerated. But how do we go around HIPAA laws um, due to incompetent to stand trial? Um, and for us to be a voice for him or for any uh, our loved ones? That is a difficult question. I, I don't know that you can circumvent HIPAA laws. I think your loved one would probably need to sign a release in order to allow someone to speak on their behalf um, to circumvent that. So that's probably some relatively simple paperwork. I would check with your local legal aid and I shall say, I am not an attorney. <laughs> I don't even play one on TV. Uh, we do have two attorneys on staff here at the American Humanist Association. I will put my email address in the chat. Please feel free to email me and I can ask our attorneys if you can give me as much information about what's going on, where you are, and we can try to find people who are local to you who can we can put you in touch with that can be helpful. Thank you so much, Nadia, for uh... Uh, the way you framed this and the uh, the understanding about the 13th Amendment. Do you have at this point the people who are in government, either elected officials or others who are involved in the prison system who are listening to you and have shown and demonstrated an understanding of where you're coming from? Thank you so much for your question, Abraham. I'm really new to the organization, so I don't think there are a whole lot of people listening to me as yet. Uh, so I say that um, tongue in cheek, but also we work with the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Um, they are a bunch of folks who are, are, are elected officials in Congress who are aligned with our community, who are free thinkers, who are, you know, somewhat atheist agnostic, spiritual, but not religious, but nonetheless, people who are values aligned with us in Congress. This has not been an issue that has been raised previously from the AHA to our uh, elected officials, nor to the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, but this is something that I am prioritizing because it's important to me as a person. I, this is not necessarily an AHA priority as, you know, per se, but it is a priority to me as a person. This is something that is of great interest and a great passion of mine as an individual. I live in East Baltimore and it's I'm adjacent to the community where they filmed The Wire, if you ever saw that show on HBO. Oh, yeah. And so there are so many people here in Baltimore that are touched by the parcel system. It is absolutely devastating here to see what happens. And they, they just released five gentlemen who were incarcerated, wrongly incarcerated for 20 some odd years, lost their freedom. Another person, uh, a podcast called Serial. Uh, oh, yes. And, and they just released him again. Yes. You know, so, you know, this is a reality that so many people, particularly people of color, working class, poor people um, are affected by of all, all, all kinds. 
Um, so this is a really personal thing for me. So we will be working with our elected officials, um, you know, certainly on other progressive pieces, but certainly as a as a piece of uh, humanitarian um, legislation, this is something that we I would love for us to to address on the on the federal level. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia, and thank you all the questioners.